Good afternoon, my friends. I am Corey Shockey, and I have the great good fortune mm -hmm. to lead the foreign and defense policy team here at the American Enterprise Institute. And we gather today, both virtually and in person, to celebrate and talk about volume one of Giselle Donnelly's amazing four volume series on Anglo-American strategic culture. It's called Empire Imagined. And those of you who came in person, it is your lucky day, because this is an extremely expensive book. And there are copies over there for free to celebrate you um, showing up in person. I am so excited about this book series. Giselle Donnelly is a senior fellow, one of the anchors of the defense policy program here at AEI. She started her career as a journalist. She was also a professional staff member on House Armed Services. And we have had the good fortune of learning from her here at AEI for some time. This book, I think it's fair to say, is actually the culmination of the entire career of your work. It's a tombstone, for, for sure. <laughs> and all four volumes are being published by the State University of New York system, which is fantastic. And they are coming in rapid sequence. But we are here to celebrate the first of them, Empire Imagined. Um, and, and Giselle, first of all, congratulations. This is. An amazing, I've read the entirety of the four, and it's amazing. You guys are so lucky to have the chance to learn from her about this. Let's start by talking about what is strategic culture? Aha, it's funny that you asked that question. <laughs> and it'll even be more humorous if I have a coherent answer to it. Um, because it's a conjunction of two notoriously imprecise terms, right? Culture, what is, what is culture? Uh, no one's ever seen one. It's not in the zoo. Um, and, and these days, particularly, what counts as strategy has become so comprehensive, uh, not to say gaseous, um, that uh, anything counts as strategy almost. If you read the National Security Strategy, it's got everything in the kitchen sink in it. However, I tried to be as... Uh, precise as possible because I think the approach is worth holding on to. Um, and, and so things that are strategic in my mind, I'm sort of a diehard Clausewitzian. So things that get to be called strategy are military things for the most part. It doesn't mean just the use of force, but the preparation for it, how you think about what the utility of military power might be, so on and so forth. But, um, you know, uh, climate change is possibly outside the Venn diagram on that one. Um, and in this context, uh, the school of strategic culture, which is... Um, I guess you would call it, uh, to call it a theory of international relations is probably too, uh, uh, too precise. And in many ways, it's not like a you know, realist theory of power. Because, the, and this is the value of the theory, um, that two different states or actors um, in essentially a similar set of circumstances might act radically differently, just because of the lenses that they bring uh, to, the, to the problem. Just to sort of conclude the, the theoretical part of the conversation, this is derived in, in modern times. Really, the, the or example of it would be George Kennan's long telegram and the uh, Mr. X article that, that followed it. And Kennan's argument was that um, not only w was the Soviet Union and the Soviet behavior shaped by Soviet ideology, but also the long arc of Russian history. Um, and this, you know, the, the, it's, it is, in terms of um, the ivory tower, sort of a, a, a more historical approach to things and a more inductive approach to, um, to analyzing uh, problems. But again, I think it's it's a useful system 
but it has never really been, we've never applied it to ourselves. <laughs> you know, oddly enough, why do we do the wacky things that we do? Uh, this is a question that you, know, you might want to ask yourself, and that's, that's where I began. So it's sweet you think we're done with the theoretical part of this. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but before we get to that, I should have said at the start that this talk is part of a, se a book series sponsored by Edward and Helen Hintz. And we are very grateful for their support in bringing books of, by scholars of national importance with important things to say about contemporary policy um, and it may surprise you to think that talking about strategic culture in Elizabethan England has contemporary applications, but I'm going to try and persuade you that that is true, um, because I disagree with you slightly, Giselle, about the fact that this, you're right, it's not a theory of international relations, but strategic culture has a lot to say about theories of international relations. And I love that you start the book with Kennan's long telegram and the example that you just used now, which is this is the refutation of the so-called realist school. That is that all powerful states behave the same and that their historical circumstances and their, their culture does not matter to their international behavior. And this whole book, looks intensely at the culture that grows out of Britain's specific historical circumstances beginning in the 16th century and coming forward and the way it informs and transplants across the Atlantic into American strategic culture. You might even say that, that uh, by the time 1776 rolls around, uh, and if you can stick with me, through all four volumes, uh, you'll, you'll learn that, that our revolution was obviously a discontinuity, but it was a revolution within a tradition. And in many ways, you can look at the colonists' complaints um, against George III and his government um, as a, a complaint that it's the king who's breaking the essential compact, particularly about Western expansion. Yeah. Uh, and to leap back to the, the beginning of the story, um, you know, things were not great for the English back in the mid-16th uh, century. Uh, you know, uh, the Tudor line was a little sketchy, <laughs> to put it mildly. They'd had their troubles even by the time Elizabeth came to the throne. She herself was, uh, although actually a political genius, was obviously a woman in a man's world, and in a like, seriously man's world. Um, it was the time of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, so uh, you know, people are setting one another on fire from, uh, from London to Germany and, and beyond, a highly charged ideological environment. And everybody understood that what had catapulted Spain to the front rank of European powers was the exploitation of its American colonies. So even the English by that point could catch on. We got to get us some of those colony things, some of, that, some of that North America stuff. So does imperialism, does the creation of colonial relationships under British military power, um, does that create the strategic culture or does the strategic culture motivate the creation of the British Empire? Well, that, <laughs> I'm going to dodge that question because that, I think that's what I like about the theory or non-theory of it, is that it allows for the interplay of circumstance and individual choice and action, but within bounds, you might say. There is, you know, when we read this older history, uh, you know, it is like an episode of the Tudors. It's all court intrigue and... Uh, it, you know, people stabbing one another in the back, either physically or uh, politically. But in fact, the nature of English society is that the political nation is a very broad one. And in fact, one of my favorite parts of the book is the final chapter, where I try to sketch that out, do little sort of uh, portraits of people that most readers will not necessarily have heard of, or will have heard of in very different contexts. For example, the, the poet Edmund Spencer, who is completely 
unbalanced in although he's a genius in many he ways. He writes the poem about Elizabeth I, the fairy queen. Everything that he writes is about somebody, you know, the allegory that people have spent their careers failing to, uh, you know, um, dissect. Uh, but in particular, he's also uh, a colonial officer. He's sent to Ireland, which is sort of the laboratory, of, or he goes to Ireland, A, because he's no longer... Uh, welcome at court and is not going to be uh, lavished with the queen's uh, largesse. So before we go to the specific portraits, yeah, that's good. what are the fundamental elements of English, because it is English at this time, Correct. strategic culture? Well, it, it is actually British. It isn't British in the union political sense, but there is an imagined, you know, there's the Arthurian myth and even going back to uh, Roman times, the idea that as a polity, uh, and, and you know, of course, the Scots haven't quite agreed to this yet, and the Irish still haven't agreed to it, <laughs> some of them, uh, to this day. But the idea is that there is, a, there is a Britain, or that there was a Britain, and that there could be a Britain again, and that there needs to be an imperial Britain in order to survive in a world of empires. Uh, you know, uh, the, the Elizabethans thought of themselves as being a weak, uh, in a weak position, lost glory and current weakness. Uh, the, the favorite line was a bone for dogs in the international scene. So that's how they, that's how they looked at themselves. And even though this Britain was a figment or a front for English conquest um, uh, of the British Isles. The, the propaganda was, or the, and the self-imagining was as a, a, a British people. It's really what I try to do throughout the book is get into the heads of these people, um, sort of understand what their worldview was and why they, uh, again, sort of why they do the wacky things that they do. And so what is their worldview? So um, it is shaped very much, they're ideologues. And uh, in this context, it, it means Protestant, although that is contended, you know. Uh, and it is a, you know, Britain is a diverse construct. It is inherently um, a multinational. You know, empire didn't always mean conquest and subjugation and oppression and things like that. Uh, but in order to function as a polity, you had to incorporate many different sorts of people. Uh, you know, English, Northern Englishmen and Southern Englishmen were very different, uh, and especially uh, Northern England was a refuge for Catholics. So, um, you know, simply establishing the Queen's writ uh, from London to the Scottish border was was a challenge. So, the glue that holds this together is. Um, is Protestantism, but Protestantism of a sort of very odd sort. There's a constant argument about whether the church should be narrow and pure or large and comprehensive. Uh, and Protestantism itself is a herd of cats, uh, you know, even from the, from the start. So it's, you need an idea that's going to hold these diverse peoples together. It's both a domestic political idea, but also an international one, too. And it's in favor of, as we would say today, preventing a hostile hegemon from dominating world affairs, and particularly the European continent. OK, so that's a, um, that's a big goal yeah. for a small, weak, um, Protestant power in the time of the counter In a dark corner of Northwest Europe. In a dark yeah. corner of Northwest right. Europe with a female ruler. Um, so tell me the story. And, and you have identified a goal and yeah. a religious element of how they view the world. Right. But what else comes into well, the um, fundamental culture you're talking about? Correct. Um, first of all, it's a pluralistic culture. You know, I mentioned that the political nation extends well outside uh, the court 
uh, and London. Um, so, uh, um, you know, there's, this is always more true than any historian can really quite come to grips with. But uh, the British political nation, the English political nation, is, is <laughs> extremely well informed, has opinions about everything, and you've got a horse trade. So it's a, again, it's, it's it, by contrast to, uh, say, Habsburg Spain, which is very much a, you know, small, uh, Philip II makes almost all the strategic decisions himself, including, you know, how to deploy the armada and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, England itself is a herd of cats. So you, and that's kind of Elizabeth's political genius, is her ability to get other people to do what she wants them to do by hooker, by crook. Um, but it gives you, it is, so it is a, again, a, a, internationally it's devoted to a balance of power in Europe, but also domestically it's devoted to a participatory pluralistic policy in order to punch above its weight. Um, and to be able to, you know, as you sort of suggested at the beginning, this is this is an imagining at this point. We are at the bottom of the heap, and we have an image of what the top of the heap looks like, and we just have we'll make it up as we go along and as circumstances dictate. And we also have, you know, they're all subcultures. For example, um, especially in the in the making of strategy. Uh, the the maritime element in British strategy has always been a powerful lure, and also the sort of, if you will, isolationist tendency. Those we we will stay away out of European affairs. We will not engage. We'll be offshore balancers to be overly uh, present uh, day about it. So. Um... The domestic political pluralism, the mm -hmm. need to uh, balance competing interests, being a weak sovereign in <laughs> many ways, and needing to do the coalition building right. of sustaining her power. Um, the the domestic so the domestic requirements yeah. of Elizabethan rule are actually very similar in type to how they view the international order. And this, I think, is what, in subsequent volumes, my friends, um, <laughs> it's a long story. is for me such an important piece. That is, uh, Britain becomes the dominant power in the international order, and it attempts to create an international order that is a macrocosm of its domestic political order. That is exactly right. Um, and it's, it's, you know, again, the thing that put me on this path, actually, uh, was my service uh, on Capitol Hill. This was during the 1990s. Um, uh, I'm a child of the Gingrich Revolution <laughs> in the sense that that's how I got my job. Um, but when I came to the committee, this was the years of the Balkans Wars, and the committee leadership and the Republican leadership more broadly, they didn't know a lot about international affairs, but they knew whatever Bill Clinton was in favor of, they were against, okay? <laughs> you know, it's the beginning of wisdom. So that, that's why they were so reluctant uh, to get involved um, uh, in Balkans affairs. But that, that changed very quickly. It was really quite striking, even the most conservative members of the committee wanted to know, well, there are good guys and bad guys. I can't remember you know, which ones are which necessarily, which ones are the Serbs and which ones are the Croats, and so on and so forth. But there's good guys and there's bad guys, and we should be on the side of the good guys, and we should do something about it. So they were compelled by things that they didn't quite understand. And so I sort of went from writing speeches and statements against getting involved in the Balkans to writing statements and speeches in favor of getting involved in the Balkans. And so I sort of just reading backwards. You figure as an American that the world began anew in 1776, right? That was the beginning of all human history. 
as I read backward, I've just struck time and time again to how much consistency there was. I mean, I, you don't want to paint these people as 19th century liberals or uh, Jeffersonian Democrats or anything like that, but the connection and the rhetoric is quite, quite vivid. If it, again, if you're at the bottom of the heap and you want to commit yourself to something that's not going to pay off in your lifetime, almost surely, but you think it's necessary, how can I inculcate that in all of us as a society and especially as, as uh, social elites to continue the project? So uh, you talked about the religious, the importance yeah. of a religious line of operations in this worldview. And you talked about the political pluralism. Let's talk about the military force of it. Yeah. Because yeah. that's how Britain plants its flag. How do they get good at this, better at this? How do they go from the bottom of the heap to defeating the Spanish Armada? and beyond that to the victory on the plains of Abraham. Yeah. Had, what are the origins of military power in British strategy? Well, it is a long haul, and it is what we would call today, at least initially, kind of a public and private, uh, or a public private partnership. Or know? as the Spanish called it, piracy. Yes, yes, a lot of us, <laughs> let's not be too delicate about this. I have a letter of Mark right here that allows me to take your bullion. By the way, those of you who don't yet uh, traffic in letters of Mark, they may be useful in a space war, in a cyber war. Um, it's a really fun subject, read Lawfare on it. Yes, yes. Um, but it's also a very useful tool for a, 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 you know, a queen who doesn't want to get overcommitted. It makes for deniability. So instead of building a navy that could dominate the world, they essentially uh, give a sovereign immunity to pirates flying the British flag to, for example, as Sir Francis Drake did, um, steal the gold ships that the Spanish were sending from the New World home to power Spain's dominance in Europe. You know, you use the tools that you have available, right? Um, it's very but, creative. It, it, again, it goes to the root. If you think right now about the diabolical creativity with which the United States and its allies weaponized the international financial system to penalize Russia, for its invasion of Ukraine. It's, it is uh, the child of Elizabethan England's creativity with letters of mark, the government saying, uh, this, is, this ship is flying under a British flag while they are committing acts of piracy. Uh, well, OK. It makes for good, good movies and television. But the interesting about, thing about it is that will only get you so far. The, the, especially in the, the, uh, the book that, in volume two, is it, really the story of a deepening and growing British state. Um, it, in the beginning, the state does not dominate the means of, of force by any stretch of the imagination. But conversely, there are weaknesses in their contemporaries. Too. As I said, the, the, the Spanish state is... They're, they're rich as heck, but you know they, they, there is not a, a body of bureaucrats that can do Philip's work for him. There are courtiers who can, but have you know they have opinions but no responsibilities, and you know yeah. uh, you know how Velasquez, that ends. the painter, is the keeper of the keys, which tells you how thin the state is. Yes, in, as in as a, as a bureaucrat, he makes a great painter. <laughs> 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 but but over the course of time. Um, and you can see it particularly uh, by the time of the Glorious Revolution. Um, one of the greatest scholars of that period is a, a fellow by the name of Steve Pincus, and he's written uh, just one of the best books uh, on the subject. And he describes what happens to the British state as going Dutch, because they import Dutch finance, um, Dutch, Dutch bureaucracy. Yeah, yes, Dutch. That's tolerance, although it doesn't stick <laughs> necessarily all the time. But by comparison, it's, it's quite tolerant. And it gives 
the British monarchy, a continental connection that is trans, uh, transferred to the Hanoverians. So they own territory in, yeah. in Northwest Europe, which is strategically important um, if you're worried about invasions. Um, but the story of the success of the empire is in the deepening and broadening state. This provides governors general for the colonies. It, pro it provides for the Royal Navy, but also for a small but very professional army. Uh, uh, and by the time the narrative is done, is, is done the British are, have an empire upon which the sun never sets. Mm -hmm. And uh, the political scientist Charles Tully famously says that war makes the state and the state makes war. Does that hold true for Elizabethan Britain? And, and if so, tell us that story. Well, it, it, as I say, at the beginning, there isn't much of a state at all. There, there's not much money. Uh, there's barely much more than a court. Um, and it's interesting. It's the war, in this case, that catapults the Navy or energizes the Navy, although uh, Military Adventures, one of the chapters, is on the English counter armada, which is a, a, a complete mess from soup to nuts uh, that happens the year after the Spanish armada. Um, and that's very much you know, rife with, uh, you know, uh, Contractors overcharging the government and all the things that come with a public-private uh, partnership, um, but um, yeah, it, it, there's an interaction there between uh, a, a whole host of things. Um, the war does make the military, and then when the military is established, it, it gives the state new horizons and new capabilities that they have not had previously. So let's talk about the Tyrone Rebellion. Aha. Uh -huh. What is it? Where Man. does it fit in this story? Well, it's interesting. Both, you know, uh, Donnelly is an Ulsterman's name. Okay, so this is like, you know, uh, my home turf. Okay. And Ulster is the, which is you know, which we do think now is the, the home of the Troubles, uh, but... Uh, in Ireland. In Ireland, yes. Um, but uh, in the late 16th century was the last Catholic bastion um, in, uh, in the last of, of Ireland's four provinces to be penetrated by English colonists, not, not for want of trying and failing. Um, and the Earl of Tyrone... Uh, who was raised as in an English home and is a fully, he's a Renaissance man. He's fully conversant with the leading uh, European ideas of the day and in particular the European military ideas of the day. So what transforms the Tyrone Rebellion from the usual cattle raiding uh, that, uh, uh, that Ulstermen are noted for is that he imports uh, uh, especially uh, uh, Spanish military practices and armaments, and eventually um, lures the Spanish into uh, fighting for the Irish Catholic cause. This is also, he's also a transitional figure in the sense that he's um, the sort of last cl great clan leader uh, of Ulster. So he's got one. He's defending the old order, introducing a new order, but introducing a new order that puts him at the center of things. And with Spanish arms putting him there. Yes. Well, but the Spanish, he, he's, the Spanish turn out to be, <laughs> you know, you don't necessarily want to rely on the Spanish unless they're centrally interested. So the, the, the war is also known as the Nine Years' War uh, in Ireland. And this would be the all-time greatest staff riot ever, by the way. Piece of shameless commerce. Uh, but the, the, the war sort of comes to an important punctuation mark um, at the Battle of Kinsale in the southernmost part of Ireland, where the Spanish have... So Ulster is in the north of Ireland, okay? So all the way at the tip, northern tip of Ireland, the Spanish land 
at the southern tip of Ireland. Uh, so um, how to join forces. So it's, um, it's Tyrone and his uh, sort of uh, charismatic uh, sidekick who marched down to try to imprison the English force that's encircling the Spanish lodgment in Kinsale and, uh, um, and, and the Irish force, which is an amazing feat of logistics for the time. This is, you know, these are peasants, uh, and only some of Tyrone's men are armed in a modern way. Uh, and they're, you know, it makes Russian logistics look advanced. <laughs> um, long story short, uh, the English, who have had a hard time uh, uh, conquering or defeating Tyrone, first of all, uh, pivot and uh, attack the Irish and then complete their besiegement of the Spanish who, who surrender almost immediately. And what's the significance of it? Well, that, that is, a, it is a punctuation. You know, Ireland remains a problem, is still a problem, but it is a vindication and a, uh, um, uh, you know, an accelerator of the English uh, colonization effort. It, again, you have, Ireland is like a laboratory, and many of the same people, as well as the same practices who are involved in these campaigns, become some of the first colonists. The, the head of the Roanoke colony is, was a captain in the English army at that time. So the so English the army is, is, is the really people. the arm of North American colonization. So I, I wanted to press you on that to, to get the idea that it's both the ideas and the people yeah. that, that migrate from different British colonies. And that takes me to what I think is a really powerful distinction you make in the book about civilized warfare and savages. Yeah. Okay, talk about that and how it plays out in North America. Again, the Irish model is imported almost, or exported almost whole cloth. And, and this, this language comes through, <laughs> again, to, to Spencer, because it's quite vivid. He writes this pamphlet that says, our purpose in Ireland is first to create, uh, you know, uh, civil order. So, we'll for, and and then that includes social order. Well, so it's, it's not meant to be simply conquest, but it's meant to be order for the because they see I, the Irish people and they see also Native Americans as fundamentally human. There's a wonderful uh, uh, series of drawings done by a man. Uh, by the name of John White from the Roanoke colony, and they're published widely throughout Europe. And it, it's clearly, you know, compared to some of the distorted figures that one sees, particularly in the, uh, the wars of the Reformation, you know, the really sort of dark uh, mangling of bodies and stuff like that. And to a British mind or an English mind, they're the, you know, as the Romans civilized us, we will civilize the Irish you know, insert your notes yeah, yeah. right here. But <laughs> because both Irish culture and Native American culture are at odds with that, this model, they never gave up on it, really. There's the after, and after civilization comes introduction of Christianity. And then they'll be like us. And importantly, they'll be our allies against the Catholic powers, first mm -hmm. Spain and then and then France. At Roanoke, the fortifications are built facing outward to the sea to defend against Spanish attack, not inward uh, in fear of Indian attack. So for those of you who haven't read it, there's a genuinely brilliant book by uh, Noel Ignatev called How the Irish Became White. And it talks about how the public perception in Anglo-American culture as late as the time of the great Irish migration to the United States, was that the Irish were parallel to the racist concept, the, the conception was parallel to the racism against blacks at the time. 
the belief that they were uneducable um, and, and the expectations. And what Ignatev tracks so interestingly is the way Irish Americans take public sector jobs to have not just reliable income but social stature. They create their own banks. The, the construction of a sameness from differentness. Um, and it, it very much grows out of this British notion, this English notion, that the wars in Ireland, like the wars against Native Americans, like the conquest of, the, of India, um, is a civilizational war against savagery. There's no, there's no recognition of the value of the independent cultures in which, right, like the only path is their path. This is a very American trait, if you ask me. I mean, the, our, the, for the English and, and for us in many ways, the complaint about the rest of the world is why can't they be more like us? And that if, they, if we just help them out a little bit, they can become just like us. Iraqis, Afghans, no problem. So, 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 you have opened the can of worms that is American strategic culture. Uh, since we're almost to the time where you all will get to ask yourself questions about her books, I, I want to pick up on, is there a uniquely American strategic culture, or to what extent is it derivative? Because that's the arc of the story in these books, the continuity. Right. And look, there are some other elements uh, that are, I think are worth mentioning. First of all, it's, it is a global view. I mean, imagine the Elizabethan situation room, OK? It's not just, it, it is a global view of uh, power and the balance of power and the balance of justice and injustice in the world. So I, I think that is a continuity, absolutely, for sure. Um, uh, the, the other things that are continuous um, are, are this sort of tension between continental commitments and maritime offshore balancing. The English love maritime descents. Even Winston Churchill sort of suffered from this disease. They never work. <laughs> they always result in horrible losses and disease and all kinds of uh, you know the things that maritime descents are noted for, but we, you know, how many people write today? America is a maritime power. Okay, there, this is an element of faith. Um, but when we're successful, as when the British were successful, it is engagement with continental allies and partners and subsidies uh, in many cases to uh, you know petty German princes or whoever. Uh, is is local, so that's a continuity, um, and clearly, the, you know, there was a famous Donald Rumsfeld quote, which I think he probably stole from Dwight Eisenhower or something like that. If you have a problem, make it bigger. <laughs> so that is a sort of an ethos that you know, if we've got a problem that we can't solve immediately and and directly. Um, we try to expand, okay? So we think of the expansion of our power as both necessary to ensure that, uh, you know, a democracy and a pluralistic society and an ideological society can survive in an essentially hostile world. Um, so I, I'm struck by the continuities. And again, I would say the, that the revolution, the American Revolution, is a revolution within the tradition. The first step that George III takes, you know, when you think about it, the road from 1763 to 1775 is very short. 1763 being Britain's the, success in the Plains in, of Abraham. Uh, correct. So driving the French out of yes. control in North America. Yes. Um, and to a North American mindset, it, you know, Benjamin Franklin is a great example of this. He's the most avid British imperialist of the age. And he's always saying, you know, if we just expand westward, think of the number of 
you know, see the taxes that you'll get from us or the import duties or the, and the sailors that we will produce and the masts from our forest. They were big on masts back then. <laughs> uh, um, you know, so like, hey, you know, if you want to be the unquestioned great power, westward expansion in America is the answer to you. And the first thing that George does is lay down the proclamation line saying no settlement west of the Appalachian crest, which is not strategically stupid because actually we have Indian allies. The Iroquois hold the balance of power uh, up until uh, the end of the Seven Years' War. So it's not stupid, but the purpose of the war from an American point of view was to enable Western expansion and to have the monarch say, you know, slow down there. I mean, George Washington's a horrible land speculator, right? So uh, this, is, this is the point where the uh, enthusiasm for British leadership begins to wane. One of the things I found when I was doing the research for my book, uh, Safe Passage, was how striking it was that the Treaty of Ghent, the treaty which ends uh, British and American contestation in the American Revolution, has a section in which the United States is required to commit that towards Europeans we will behave by European laws even if we fight savages by a whole different set. And it really reinforces your notion about the continuity of this concept. You know, it, it, it is almost as though they fall, the, the British fall away from this compact. I mean, again, that's the, the colonists, one of their, their many complaints. And I, I think, you know, you know, you read the long justification in the Declaration of Independence of all of uh, Georgia's and his government's uh, malfeasance. <laughs> and you know, a lot of them are kind of uh, dicey arguments, you might say. Uh, but, but again, the, the, the idea that you're going to stand in the way of us fulfilling our mutual destiny, that's OK. We'll go on without you. <laughs> you know. So I want to underscore this point uh, that you made about uh, the easy notion that Britain and the United States have a similarity because we're both maritime powers, which every time I hear it, I start scratching my head and think, we fought 173 Indian wars to consolidate the political control of the continent and the cultural control of the continent. How is it we are described? So why does this myth perpetuate for both Britain and the United oh, States? Well, because you know, naval people are you know overrepresentative, <laughs> overrepresented <laughs> in important decision making. But plus, it's such an alluring narrative, right? Uh, you know, who doesn't want to be Errol Flynn flying from the rings, right? Um, but you know, here's another. Uh, possible, I mean, this is all hypothetical to a certain degree. You know, the British were very reluctant to dictate the terms of governance, uh, certainly in continental Europe. You know, they're very happy, but they could, you know, perfidious Albion, they could switch. You know, they did, the allies for them were, you know, auxiliaries. Transactional. Yeah, it was very transactional. The, like, it was difficult to imagine the British doing what we did in Japan and Germany after World War II. Um, or, or, I mean, again, it's, these are gradations, uh, you know, and I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, either be too critical or too praising of British colonialism. Uh, but, you know, compared to being uh, a French colony or a Belgian Belgium. colony, right, or, or a Spanish colony, it has some things going for it. Um, but I, again, I think, I think our commitment, our commitment to our ideology was expressed in the Declaration in the Constitution, founding documents. It developed in Britain more organically and less directly. Uh, it was it was the glue and is the glue that kind of holds uh, the British Isles together. But the, you know, there's no sort of explicit statement 
uh, of commitment to the principles in quite the same way. So before I open up to your questions, um, let me just give you the chance to pick your favorite delicious story about queens and advisors. Okay. Well, so in this final section, so there's, there's, there are four people who are profiled. I mentioned Spencer a bit. He's, he's just he's, he's unique. But also, there are some people who are representative. One is a representative sort of, sort of the Cambridge humanist, Renaissance, English Renaissance man, who was sort of a second tier advisor, never really made it uh, to the uh, inner uh, sanctum, so to speak. Um, there's also um, a, a representative of the developing British Army. I mean, this is where the army begins to professionalize. So um, Sir John Norris pops up everywhere in the story, not always uh, you know, uh, covered in glory, but he's an example of the British struggle to master land warfare as well as uh, nautical warfare. But my favorite person is... Um, a uh, fellow by the name of John Dee, who popularized the idea of the old British Empire. Um, he was a sort of necromancer. Uh, uh, he, Elizabeth and all his, her most senior advisors were, were also into trying to turn anything into gold, like chemically and stuff like that. So he's, a complete, he's got like one foot in the medieval world uh, and one foot in uh, the modern world of the time. And, and he's a hopeless loser, okay? So he's, you know, he, he works for, he's, he's a great cartographer and compiler of travel narratives and stuff like that. So it, he's, you cannot, you know, I don't, there's, I can't think of a modern day analog to this. He's like, he's like one part you, one part, uh, you know, television evangelical, so he's, yeah, and the queen, and again, her most educated advisors always are looking for a shortcut. <laughs> you know, if we can just, uh, you know, say the three magic words, the Spanish will go away or something like that. So it's, it's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a society that's, got, again, got one foot in the mythical past, another foot sort of in the medieval mindset, very squarely uh, uh, in the Renaissance, and looking forward and anticipating the Enlightenment to, to a certain degree. So it's a fascinating look. And the idea that this guy could have political influence, you know, it, not even would Donald Trump uh, invite a necromancer to the White House. Well, I don't even want to think about this. But, <laughs> but it's sort of didn't? like that. <laughs> yeah, well, well, not to our knowledge, right? <laughs> okay, I have had the fun and games this whole time. Won't you please join in the conversation? To be brief, your question to her about um, the structural... Please culture. tell us who you are. Uh, J.P. Hogan. In the past, I've written on this, bringing up Cromwell or and Rene Descartes and the Pilgrims all happening at the same time, and then bring in Adam Smith instead of your focus on it. But you bring up the English versus the U.S. as strategic, and it was, the English had to spread the Church of England. The U.S. could say, "Here's your Bible. Here's your Bible in English. Go be Pilgrims." Yeah. So do you cover? You didn't go into that. We now had an English Bible, and it was the text was now available to people to. It's America let you people just yeah, go that, and interpret it themselves. It didn't have to be a divine right of kings. Yeah. Well, uh, it didn't really eradicate the idea of the divine. All the English kings thought themselves, of, and certainly Elizabeth thought of herself as a divine right uh, monarch. But, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, spreading the text w was an important political uh, way of politically drawing the nation together, especially when we were talking about um, uh, 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 sort of decatholicizing the north of England, if you will, where, which was not, you know, um, particularly Rome-centered per se, but it was just the traditional, it, it was more traditional, and that the, the English church was breaking with the traditional ways of worship. But it was important, A, to get aggressive bishops and 
preachers in the pulpit. One of the big problems that Elizabeth had was the poor education of her clerical class. So there was a really big effort, not because there were important you know, theological issues to discuss per se, but it was important to sort of get the word out to, and in an articulate way and get out to, to rally the, the people. Uh, so, and, and so Elizabeth and the government after her, the governments after her, routinely uh, paid for, uh, you know, biblical texts and um, annotated commentary on, on the Bible to be put in every church so people could access it. And the thought was that this would draw the nation together politically as well as confessionally. Yes. My name is Joe Freeman. I write books on women in politics, which is completely irrelevant to my question. Last week, I went to a lecture um, on the War of 1812 by a Canadian who talked about the U.S. invasion of Canada for the purpose of annexing Simply it. a matter of marching, said President Jefferson. Or, yes. <laughs> or who was then out of office. So I was just wondering if you, I know it's probably jumping a little ahead to volume two, but I was just wondering if you would put that in the context of your overall argument, because he said some things about the War of 1812. I've never heard before, and I've studied a lot of American history. Also, there's not just one U.S. invasion of Canada. Yeah. This is a... This is a frequent experience. It's an idea <laughs> whose time always comes. Always comes. Right. Well, yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, the Canada question, for the longest time, you know, it, it's, it's really a, arguably the defeat in the War of 1812 that finally puts the kibosh on this idea. But, um, you know, that's an, another... One of the big complaints about George is, again, George has a good reason for this. What do you do with 80,000 you know, French-Canadian Catholics who are now y your subjects? So, so eventually, he turns the Ohio Valley into part of the province of Quebec, um, which, again, is not what the Americans were thinking exactly. So the, the interrelation, you know, the, the, the Canada strategic problem or the interconnection between what we know as the United States and the sovereign Canada, back then, you know, it took a long time to, to sort that out, to, to put it mildly. And, uh, you know, there's invasions of Quebec sort of <laughs> on a regular basis. One other thing, there's a political connection to it as well, because as late as the time of the Louisiana Purchase by the Jefferson administration, um, the political opposition to President Jefferson buying from Napoleonic France the Louisiana Territory is that it's full of Catholics and Catholics cannot be Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so religion and politics web together in this in ways that that it takes a long time for that for that bias for that religious bias to attenuate. Well, and it's, it, it has a, some basis in experience as well. I mean, all you have to do is uh, you know uh, uh, mention a, a, a French priest in an Indian village, and you can be sure that he's like a green beret. Uh, riling up the uh, the local tribes to make war, you know the uh, the, the church militant uh, in France was a serious thing. So so so, um, how relevant to today's American reflexes? I, if I may jump three books ahead, yeah. Um, how relevant to today's American reflexes? in strategic culture is this Marvel Comics origin story that begins <laughs> with Elizabethan England. Well, OK, there's the, the basic injunction to know yourself. OK, why, do realists, why are realists always miserable? There's, there's never been an American president who can satisfy them, regardless of what they did. It's always the sorrows of empire. And not only 
are they lamenting their own lack of influence, but because they, their theory is meant to be a predictive theory, they're always wrong about American behavior. You know, if your theory can't explain American behavior, then maybe you should go back to the drawing board. So I think to, for us, to, especially at moments like the one that we're in, or have been in, whether it was the you know, sort of happy times of the post-Cold War peace, but now again that we find ourselves in an era of increasing geopolitical competition, remembering what victory looks like to you and you know, what your purpose in the world is, is kind of important. Okay? I mean, we, we're still struggling with this. Um, whether it's uh, in regard to Ukraine, or in regard to the Middle East, or certainly in, in regard to China. But also, you know, in, amongst our sort of international relations strategic elite, their analogies are all, you know, from Europe in the 19th century, or, or the immediate post-Cold War era. And it doesn't include, you know, it's always about the struggles of great powers, the giant, you know, uh, sort of uh, muscle-bound uh, competition that, you know, certainly may define the international order, but not in every detail. I mean, there's so much, there, for every great power war, there are hundreds and hundreds of small power skirmishes and wars or proxy wars and stuff like that. So. I think particularly of military officers, you know, a group of Americans to whom we are all uh, more devoted than maybe we should be. But to give them some new analogies for thinking through the problems, I couldn't help but wonder when I was researching the Tyrone War if, if you know, our, our leaders in Afghanistan had read about this war instead of the Mau Mau uprising or something like that, they would have understood the duration and the complexities and the political dynamics of irregular um, uh, warfare much better than they did. So I guess twofold purposes in the large measure, um, you know, again, sort of rebooting ourselves, understanding ourselves before we sort of uh, venture out into the world uh, is something that's overdue and the thing that maybe could help us the most. Uh, and also, again, you know, people do tend to make decisions on the basis of historical analogy. So opening the aperture on that, and particularly, you know, again, to, to understand where we're coming from. Why, it is, why it's so hard for us to just act uh, as a you know, mechanic, as a balancer of various, or a juggler of various geopolitical billiard balls. We have a hard time doing that. I mean, we think victory is defined by justice, not by power. And we should understand that. It doesn't mean that we have to like, rush in everywhere and try to right all wrongs. But that's how, you know, that's how we know we're done. As when Japan looks like it does now as opposed to Japan in 1939 or, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that's a wonderful place to draw this conversation to a close. My friends, won't you thank me? Won't you join me in thanking <laughs> I will thank you. <laughs> join Profusely. me in thanking Edward and Helen Hintz for sponsoring this series of book talks and Thank you, Giselle Donnelly, for this exquisite first volume of an exquisite four-volume series. Won't you join me? Thank you.